let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Oh, sorry. Really, Father, we just uh, thank you for this day and just ask you to bless this class. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings to us. We just thank you, Lord, that um, you loved us even uh, when we sin against you, Lord. You, your grace covers everything, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Um, so, to get to it, uh, I did post a syllabus, and, um, you know, I, I think the uh, quality of the service did it just turn off? No. Red light still working in the background. Okay. <laughs> I, heard a, I heard a beep, a suspicious beep. It was distracting me. Um, but that's easy enough to do. So, um, you know, somebody once said that the quality of the syllabus is inversely proportional to its length. So I'm, I'm happy that I cut the syllabus down to four pages. I usually have like four, five, or six. So, you know, this one's at least 20, 30% better, something like that. Now, if I could give no syllabus for a course, well, that's that's the height of academics right there. What's that? It'd be infinitely good. That's right. It would be, it would be infinitely good. That's right. exactly right. Um, so, who here has had linear linear algebra? Who has not had linear algebra? Uh, who has read something about linear algebra despite not having it? Okay, then you get you get. So, um, advanced calculus essentially. As I envision it, it's an extension of linear algebra. Now, that's not to say that if you haven't had linear algebra, it's hopeless for you. That's not at all the case. In fact, we'll learn the linear algebra we need as we go. Um, so, what is what is linear algebra in a nutshell? Well, linear algebra is the study of spaces, right, which have some way to add things and some way to scale and multiply things, right? And, um, and then we study linear transformations, which are functions from one vector space to another, uh, which preserve the multiplication, right? That, that in a nutshell is what linear algebra is about. So for us in here, I, I just need to define a few more terms. So in linear algebra, we have, so let's say V is a vector space. The vector spaces we'll look at in here um, are, are going to be over the real numbers, right? That means our scalars are from the reals. And um, so like the, the fundamental things we want to, you know, fundamental concepts that we do need on occasion are the notion of uh, linear independence, which I'm going to write out just this once. Now, so our, our, our go-to abbreviation for this is LI, right? We also need the concept of spanning, um, spanning set. All right. Now, so what, is, what does it mean for, what, what, is, what is linear independence? Basically, Here's the idea. If you have a set of vectors S, and it's a subset of some vector space V, when we say that that set of vectors is linearly independent, if the vectors in S are, well, linear, yeah, because that seems like kind of circular. If there's no linear dependence between them, right? Or be more precise, if the only linear dependence between the vectors in S is the trivial dependence, right? So an equation to state that is that you know if you've got c1 v1 plus da, 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 plus ck vk equals to zero, so that's a linear. That would be a linear dependence, right? If this is if s is a linearly independent set, and, and so here I'm supposing that v1 and vk are an s, then this must imply that the coefficients are all zero. In other words, the only linear dependence of a linearly independent set is the trivial dependence. That's how we that's how we check linear independence. We'll, we'll need that from time to time here. What's a spanning set? Well, spanning set basically boils down to this. We need that the span, so if I take the span of say v1 dot vk, uh, what this is defined to be is just it's just the set of all possible linear combinations of those vectors. Alright, so now this time instead of forcing the constants to be zero, we allow them to be anything. And so for us, this would be a real span. Ooh, I'm using set builder notation. Should I stop and explain that to you? Uh, sure. Go for it. So I'm saying this object, things like this, such that this is true. But that's just saying that we have these vectors, v1 through vk. And we're basically weighting, weighting them by the scalars, 
these real numbers, C1 through CK, and it's just all possible linear combinations, right? So geometrically, you can think of it like, well, I'd like to say you can think of it as a k-dimensional plane, right? But this is an abstract vector space. V could be a set of like matrices or polynomials or whatever. So if I, if I say it's some kind of like abstract plane, you should keep in mind that's, well, it's, it's a little bit abstract. And I can also not immediately say it's k-dimensional, right? Because there's no reason that there has to be, that these have to be independent unless I say so, right? And that brings us to our next concept, basis. What's a basis? So basis. So beta is a basis for vector space B, right? Again, this is over the riddles, right? I'm going to stop saying that. Uh, beta is a basis for the vector space V over the real estate, what, what, do we, what two things do we need for a beta to be a basis? What's that one? Linear independence. Right, beta is linearly independent. And two? It spans V. Right, the span of beta is equal to V. Oh, I should mention, there's another way to define span that's more in terms of like pure linear algebra, which doesn't involve this formula. You could also define it to be the intersection of all possible subspaces which contain the vectors v1 through vk. It's the, it's the minimal subspace containing those vectors. But this works for us in here. <coughs> so this is what a basis is. It's a linearly independent spanning set. Um, one of the major accomplishments of Math 321 is to prove that if you have a vector space and there's one basis with finitely many vectors in it, and every other possible basis for that vector space has the same number of vectors. So the number of vectors in the basis is what we call dimension. So, you know, supposing it, um, so the number, if the number um, in beta is less than infinity, and um, beta is basis for V, then the dimension of V is by definition the number of elements of beta. where I hope you understand the meaning of my notation number. Is it okay? Should I formally define it in terms of bijections to the natural numbers? Would that make it more right? I guess they card down me. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not being, yeah, don't think cardality, this is just counting. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not being so transfinite or anything, whatever. Okay, so then your independent span basis and then the awesome thing about a basis, of course, is it allows us to take a vector space and put coordinates on it, right? So what's the notion of a coordinate system? If beta is equal to, say, v1 through vn, then the coordinate v sub beta um, <clears throat> of, let's say, x1 v1 plus, da, 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 plus xn vn, that's just equal to what? So the coefficients are x1 through xn, and so the coordinate map just says you take these uh, abstract basis vectors and you replace them with like a unit basis vector. So here's the formula. Um, so the difference between this, this right here is in the abstract vector space v, whereas this over here is in the set of column vectors. It's in Rn. <coughs> This is the, the coordinate, coordinate map corresponding to the basis beta. Now, another way to say this, which I'm fond of, and you should be too, because it allows us a lot, much laziness as we go on here, is that we could just say phi beta um, of vj is just equal to ej, and then extend linearly. That's another major accomplishment of linear algebra. We learn that if we define a linear transformation on the basis of a vector space, then it uniquely extends to a linear transformation on the entirety of the vector space. Which doesn't seem like much if you're in the middle of linear algebra, but if you kind of take a step back and look at it, you're saying that this function, if it's defined on a finite number of points, n points in the vector space, there's only one function that goes to the entirety of the vector space and is linear. If I tell you f of x is equal to 2 for a function from the reals to the reals, and then I say find the formula, you'd be like, 
I mean, let's say f of 2 is equal to 3. Now find the formula for f. What was the problem? Why can't you do it? So I said f of 2. So here's the point. <laughs> f of 2 is equal to 3. Now tell me the value, tell me the function. Right? You can't do it, <laughs> right? Unless I tell you it's a linear function. In which case, the formula for f is immediately known just to be f of x is equal to mx because that's the only linear function on the reals. Unfortunately, linear functions are actually affine functions. If you add the plus b, then f of 0 is not a 0, so it's not a linear function anymore. I'm getting into way too much detail here, but I think it's not bad to kind of stop. That's the only linear function that goes to that point. One point defines a line through the origin. And this is the generalization of that to arbitrary vector spaces. Now, <clears throat> I just threw out some notation, ej, what is that? Yeah, this is the, the standard basis. So, excuse me. Let me, uh, so here's the way we define it, ej, i component of that, right, is equal to Kronecker delta ij. You're like, what's the Kronecker delta? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's 1 if i is equal to j. It's 0 if i is not equal to j. So this defined, basically, so like, for example, e1 is equal to 1, 0, da, 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 0, and en is equal to 0 all the way out, all the way up until you get a 1 in the last spot. And the length of the vector, of course, depends on the context. But these are, these are the, the fundamental vectors in RM. In physics, we would have called them like x1 hat, x2 hat, whatever. Yeah, physics, you mean. Um, let's see here. Any questions about the notation? So, of course, you'd like some examples, right? not going to devolve into me trying to teach all of linear algebra in a day. That would be foolish. Give us less words, yes? <laughs> so I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go into like why. What I'm about to say um, is true. I'm just going to make some claims. But these are pretty obvious claims, all right? Like, um, <clears throat> Now, now, let me just give you a, a look ahead briefly. What we're doing right now is trying to define the vector space. A little bit later in this lecture, I'm going to tell you how we define the notion of distance on the vector space. Once we have a notion of distance on the vector space, then we can define limits. Right? And then once we have limits, we can talk about continuity. And then once we've settled continuity, we can talk about differentiability. Hopefully all of those things will happen this week. Let's let me keep talking. So, our standard examples. Oh, I know what I was about to say and I forgot to. This is just my custom. You notice that these are these look these might appear to be row vectors to you, but you should understand my convention is that these are sneaky, sneaky column vectors. This is actually a shorthand for one zero to dot zero, and this is actually a shorthand for zero to dot one. If I wanted to actually talk about. Um, if I actually wanted to talk about honest to goodness row vectors, I will do like E1 transpose would be 1, 0, like that. I use column vectors, so, but at the same time, I don't want to put this in the middle of typing paragraphs, so this is my uh, compromise. The, the, the price that I have to pay for it is to make this discussion at the start of every course. But so, so the round parenthesis means that it's actually a column. Right. Square, square bracket means that it's real. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Because we take, basically the point is I take Rn to be column vectors. And conceptually, I think of these as points or as vectors from the origin, depending on my emphasis. But standard examples. Of course, you've got V equals to Rn. That's a vector space, right? And what's the, uh, you know, the basis for that? 
the standard basis is E1 through AN, right? So what are the, <laughs> what's, the what's the coordinate map look like here? If you made a, of x1, e1, I'm ashamed to even write this. I, I'm wasting your time. I'm sorry. I, I'm even writing this. But. So remember, basically, the, essentially here, the, the point is vj is equal to ej. So it just, I really probably should have just written v beta of x is equal to x. In other words, the, the with respect to the standard basis on our end, the coordinate map is just the identity map. Right? Um, <clears throat> now, let's see here. V equals to Cn. Well, the, first of all, we do our m by n. So this is the set of m by n matrices. All right? Now, what's that look like? Basically, you've got something like what? A11, A1n, AMN. The last one out here is AM, AM1, right? Such that AIJ are in the reals. So that, that's, you know, that's what a matrix looks like, right? Now, you see what I can do is I can write this. Um, well, let's say for here, A in B has A equals to a sum um, over I equals 1 to, let's see, I goes from 1, I is the row index, it goes from 1 to n. J is the column index in, in my current formulation here, J equals 1 to n. Those are not reserved. I'm not saying I is always the row index and J is always the column index, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying for this formula right here, it's the row and column. A, I, J, E, I, J, B, I, J. Now, this E, I, J is the standard um, matrix unit. So you have E, I, J, the KL component of that. Here, let me just, let me break it down for you real, real, real basic here. If I have A11, A12, A21, A22, see, I can write that as A11, 1, 0, 0, 0, plus A12, 0, 1, 0, 0, plus A21, 0, 0, 1, 0, plus A22, 0, 0, 0, 1. All right. And that you come up? No, no. Or you're just laughing at the absurdity of me getting the limits today. Maybe that will get that. No, I probably shouldn't erase that. Oh well. Now, <clears throat> okay, so this is what we call E11. This guy is E12. This one is E21. This one is E22. All right. In fact, those are linearly independent, and you can see, for example, that I can build any two by two matrix by these, right? So, in fact, this the set of these things gives you a basis for the set of matrices, right? And what's the what? How do you define like what's the definition for this? It's, it's only zero. It's only one when i is equal to k, and when j is equal to l. So the formula for that you can use the pair of Kronecker deltas. It's Kronecker delta IK, Kronecker delta JL. See that? This this is only equal to one when both of these are one. This is only both is only both one when I is equal to K J is one. Okay, so then if you list these in sort of the lexicographic order, which is, I mean, these are actually in order. This one, then this one, then this one, then this one. All right. Then that gives you the standard coordinate map on the matrices. So here, here it is, P beta of A is equal to, and I'm, <laughs> I'll be really lazy here, it's A11, start with A11, go the way out to A1n, so that's the first row, right? And then you do the second row, all the way up to the m row, M1, AMN. 
Okay, so that's the coordinate map on FIN, real matrices. That's what I mean. It's just, all you do is just take the rows and just, you know, lay them out one, by, one, one at a time. No. So, for the sake of, no, I can't do that yet. No, oh well. Yeah, I'm going to have to shift to another board here in a bit. It's inevitable. All right, so the next, try to. Let me call this V1 and 2, all right? Because I want to talk about four examples, okay? What are my other two examples? V2 is CN. I think it's good to have some examples of complex matrices. Some of you would like to understand quantum mechanics, right? I think. So I'm going to try to work some discussion of like Hermitian spaces into the homework, give you a chance to. I mean, it's not, it's not really that sophisticated in terms of the complex analysis of it. Pretty much it's just basic, you know, if you've done phasers and electrical, it would be very sort of natural extension of that kind of algebra. Um, so anyway, CN is just n, n, uh, n complex vectors, right? So what that looks like is C is something like C1, da da da, CN, right? Now, each one of these is a complex number, right? So each one of those can be expanded into a real and imaginary part. So that's like x1 plus <coughs> iy1, right? xn plus iyn. But then I can pull out the real scalars, right? I can rewrite this, and I'm not going to write. You see if you can see what I'm writing now. I'll write the first thing you tell me what I just did. x1 times what? Times e1, right? Plus y1 times what? xn times what? Plus yn times what? You fill the blanks for me. y1 times ie1. ie1, right? times en. en, yeah. Next, ien. So in fact, the natural basis to use for cn is just E1, IE1, E2, IE2, and so forth and so on. This, in fact, is a linearly independent set over the reals, right? And um, that's, and, and so what is the coordinate map corresponding to that? So with Z is, Z is the same as it was up here. You just do what? You just list out real, imaginary, real, imaginary, real, imaginary, just like that, right? Okay, so obviously the dimension of Rn is n. What's the dimension of the n by n matrices over R? How many, how many coordinates are there here? This is an element of R1. So for this one, well, two by two, like two plus two is four, two times two is four. This is a horrible thing to look at and try to figure anything out about it. But yeah, this is also two times two, there's four of them. If you had three by two matrices, that's a six dimensional space, right? How about this? This is an element of R 2 n okay? What do you think my fourth example is? Yes, yes. So, yeah. Oh, and some of you probably were thinking, that's three. Yeah, sorry about that. I was hoping you'd do the same example over again, actually. <laughs> I'll take that. See, so see, M by N, all right. I'm going to just write the coordinate map for you this time. P beta, um, Z, let Z be an M by N complex matrix. You know what it is? And so let's, let's let uh, Z equal to x plus, I have maybe, I have maybe a tire right now, x plus i big y, right? 
where these um, x, big X, and big Y are both real matrices. So what, what is the coordinate map here? It's just x11, y11, you get the idea, x, m, n, y, m, n. And if I tell you the coordinate map, you can also figure out what the basis was. What is the basis then? I didn't write the basis yet. What is the basis here? <laughs> right. So let me just say it's E I J comma I E I J suitably ordered. <laughs> um, as to avoid a bunch of writing. Anyway, but of course a basis is a basis we we talk about a basis and vector spaces. Basis and linear algebra, we're talking about an ordered basis, right? If I switch the order of things you get a different coordinate map. Right. It's kind of important, right? Because that's like changing north to the west or North to east, and like flipping the meaning of those should matter when you think about the notion of coordinate, right? So we have to talk about other bases. All right. Those are our standard examples. Now, what we can do with those, of course, is we can look at subspaces of those things, right? So what's a what's a subspace? It's a subset of a vector space. It's also a vector space. A subset of a vector space is also a vector space. Very good. Um, so just as a bit of notation, you know, subspace, we'll say W is a subspace of V. That, that, that's, that's how we denote that, right? And so there, there's lots of cool things we know about subspaces. Um, if you have a subset, a non-empty subset of a vector space, which is closed under addition and scalar multiplication, it's a subspace, right? That's the two-step two subspace test. Another popular way to see that something's a subspace is if it's the span of a set of vectors, it's a subspace, right? So those, those things are, are good to remember. Um, all right, so just a word or two then about linear transformations. Uh, man, I really want to erase all this stuff. So I'm just going to talk to you about linear transformations and not write anything. That's OK. What is a linear transformation? You have two vector spaces, right? So I'm going to write just a scribble up here a little bit. So a linear transformation, something like t from v to w, is a linear transformation. It's a function from v to w, right? Such that what? x plus y is equal to t of x plus t of y, right? And also t of cx is equal to c times t of x. That has to be true for all vectors x and y and for all real constants c. So that's additivity and homogeneity. You have those two things, you have a linear transformation, right? Now, can you represent that by matrix multiplication? Yes. Yes, but there's some fine print. For an abstract vector space, we have to run it through the coordinates, right? And that's kind of an involved thing. You might not have seen it in linear algebra. If you did 221, you probably didn't see it. So I'll, I probably will have a homework for you guys that helps you, that walks you through that. It's not, it's not super complicated or anything. It's just there's something really special that happens when you have a linear transformation from column vectors to column vectors, right? The special case is that if, if t is, is, a, is a mapping from, say, Rn to Rm, then what can you do? You've got t of x is equal to standard matrix of t times x. Right? So if we put it in brackets like that, that's the standard matrix of t. But if I'm in an abstract vector space, I don't have necessarily a standard basis to go to. I mean, I told you these are the standard bases for these things, but it's not universally agreed upon. Right? So for pretty much anything except for Rn, unless you have a special context, you, you have to state the basis. And there's like a lot of fine print that you have to add. There is a formula for an abstract, vector, abstract linear transformation in terms of matrix, but Again, we have to run it through the, the coordinate maps. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a moment about that. But this is very simple, right? So if we're working in Rn to Rm, linear transformations are really, really simple because you can, you can just write them in terms of this one uh, matrix multiplication, so-called standard matrix, right? Okay. So eventually in this course, after just a couple lectures, we'll just be in Rn. So then this will be true, and we won't have to face 
too much of the, the coordinate stuff. But I, the start, the first few lectures, I want to try to stay up at the level of, of what's called a norm space so that you appreciate the generality. And also, we can do some really neat problems about finding, like, studying calculus of matrices and things, which I think, which I think is interesting. Um, let's see here. I'm, I'm planning to give you guys another homework, uh, homework problem. So some homework problems to like refresh your memory on these things. It really is not hard. Uh, the other thing I'm going to give you a little bit about is um, the direct sum decomposition, right? Uh, vector space D is the direct sum decomposition of D1 plus V2. Uh, this, this plays an important role as we study tangent spaces and normal spaces as we go on in here. So I, I'd like to explain that to you a little bit. And um, so this just means that everything in V is either in V1 or V2, but it's, it's, it's also uniquely so. So like the only thing that's in both V1 and V2 is 0. If you give me a vector x and v, there's, a, there's an x1 and an x2, x1 being in v1, x2 being in v2, so that you can get back to it. I mean, this is familiar to us if you think about like a y-axis and an x-axis, but um, anyway, I, okay, I'm not getting off track now. So listen, I, I, um, I know it's a lot to ask of you to re review all of linear algebra. That, I mean, my notes are like 300 pages, so that seemed kind of mean. So what I've done is I've written like a little review chapter that um, is it's pretty dense, but in about eight pages or so, I flesh out this in a lot of details. And so if you read that, you should be at least good up, uh, you know, you should have some moral appreciation for linear algebra. We don't actually use all those things, so I'm just trying to make you aware of some of the issues. And as is usually the case in my course, if you can do the homework, you're, you're, you're okay. And if you can't do the homework, you should ask me for help. Uh, okay. Now, to erase all these things. I, I have to. No. Right, so that, that brings us to the study of norm spaces. Oh, by the way, I think this is about the most theoretical arc in the course. Um, apparently, I just tried to review a three-hour credit course in the space of 15 minutes or whatever, so that maybe seems like a bit much, especially if you haven't had it. Um, do not dismay, <laughs> or if you haven't just had it for me. Um, <clears throat> do not dismay. I'm mostly trying to make you aware of a language that we're going to use. Norm spaces. And I'm actually not, um, oh, yes. So here's the definition. <clears throat> so we're, we're going to talk about the vector space, all right? So V, a vector space over the reals paired with, we use this notation like double vertical bars. That's the norm. Norm. Um, so V, it's real value, okay? And it satisfies a couple of important characteristics, right? So here's the definition. Um, one, two, three, four. Now, intuitively speaking, what we're trying to do is we're trying to abstract the notion of vector length. So the properties of this should be like the essential features of the length of a vector that you, you study it's in Calculus 3, right? So let's see here. First of all, we know that the length of a vector is, oh, sorry, I want to, oh, what if we do scalar multiplication? How should that work? If I multiply a vector by 2, it doubles the length, right? If I multiply the vector by minus 2, 
it still doubles the length, just it turns its direction around, right? So the formula for that, this is called homogeneity, it's just you can pull out the absolute value of the scalar with the normal function, right? So there's that. Homogeneity, or some people say absolute homogeneity. You've got this, um, I mean, the ordering, some people might put this last, I don't know. Yeah, this one. This is called the triangle inequality. If you think about x and y being the horizontal and vertical x to a triangle, it's like you've got x, you got y, and then x plus y is here. So, of course, the length of the hypotenuse is less than the sum of the lengths of the legs. Triangle inequality. Um, and then also this, um, what we say in terms of inequality, this is what, greater than or equal to zero. And sometimes people will separate, sometimes people will combine three and four into one thing. I'm just making it two things so that I don't lose anybody in the audience, all right? It's not negative, but when is it zero? When is the norm zero? Right. If and only if. Or I could do the double arrow by conditional, right? If only x is equal to zero. These are the necessary ingredients to call the, this function a norm. And a vector space with a norm is called a norm, just a, you know, a norm vector space. Or if we want to be a little bit Russian in our lingo, we could say that all of this together, it, you know, v paired with, let's say v, let's say down here, v paired with the norm um, is a normed linear space. So we'll call it an NLS, normed linear space. Okay. I'm sorry, what is the meaning of the double bars? The double bar is, you know, so I'm giving you a set of axioms. If, if you have some function on a vector space that satisfies these four things, it's, it's a norm. Uh, this, this notation is just a shorthand for like, I mean, the actual function, I mean, it's just, it's a notation, I don't know what to say. <laughs> <clears throat> so, what are the norms? Um, and okay, so once we have this norm, we can do other things. Like, let me just get to it. What, what's the definition of an open ball then, in, with respect to the norm? So here's, I can talk about open ball. Open ball. Oh man, it's markers. Okay. Uh, so, for example, an open ball. Uh, radius epsilon centered at x is what? Yeah, let's say, let's say v and v such that what? x minus v is less than epsilon. I don't know, for some reason I want to write v minus x, but I can, you're, you know, the, the norm of x is equal to the norm of minus x follows from the absolute homogeneity. If it's equal to minus 1, you get. But yeah, so this is, so what, what Daniel is doing is he's, what, what's this thing he's doing here? Like, we, we understand that from, if you've studied physics, you recognize that as the displacement vector, right? So what you're really saying is the distance between v and x is given by the length of the displacement vector from the point x to the point b. Like that's where this is coming from. Um, but this has to be less than what? Less than epsilon, right? So this would define essentially an open ball in, in the normed linear space. Right? And we actually just stumbled upon another thing, which is the distance function. What's the distance function? The distance function d from, let's say, v to x is equal to the norm of um, v minus x. So you can define a distance function once you have a norm. If I can just stay up in the clouds here for a minute more. Um, if you have a set paired with a distance function, that's called a metric space. What is a distance function? What, what makes distance distance? Again, another set of axioms, okay? So like distance from x to y is equal to the distance from y to x, right? 
same coming and going. It's not like your commute to work. Um, <laughs> the distance, uh, let's see here, the distance from x to x is what? Zero, Zero right? Um, the distance from x to, oh, I thought I did. I'm about to repeat myself. Don't do that. Um, the distance from x to y is what? Also, it's greater than or equal to zero, right? So these two things that I just wrote collectively are, are referred to as positive definite. The metric is positive definite. And then you also have this distance from x to y plus the distance from y to z is greater than or equal to the distance from x to z. This is also called the triangle inequality. That's the triangle inequality for norms. This is the triangle inequality for a metric. Now, if you have D, it's a mapping from some space across itself back into the reals, all right? If you have this mapping D, if it satisfies these axioms, that makes M into what's called a metric space. I said nothing about linear algebra here. You can, you can give a met, you can make all kinds of weirdo shapes into metric spaces. There's no notion of vector addition necessarily in this. So this is a much, much fuzzier notion. And that's not really the, the province of this class. This is something you'd study properly in analysis. Okay? Met 431 should study this carefully. Should study this carefully. Um, it has. Sometimes. So if it's a norm linear space, it's automatically a metric space because you can induce a metric by just this vector length idea. You cannot reverse this though because this does not assume the structure of a linear, uh, linear space. It's not a vector, the end of empty vector space, so you can't reverse this, this, this idea. There's another important thing which you have been exposed to. How do we, do, how do we when, I, when I teach physics, some of you guys have physics in here, right? I mean, how do, how do we, can I, how do we define the vector length? What do we use to do it? The what? Yeah, but the, what did I use to do it? The, the dot product, right? Remember, we're just, we're immersed in the dot product. Where's the dot product in all this? What's the, what's the generalization of dot product? Well, that, that's what's called an inner product space. So yet another, <laughs> yet another abstract notion which I should share with you because it's just a decent thing to do at this point in your education is that there's something called an inner product space. Now, an inner product space, which I will put in purple over here, so if you have V paired with, and so, sorry, more of this kind of fuzzy notation. Bradley, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Um, I love your last name. It's amazing. But, um, so this is a mapping from V cross V into the, to the reals. If, if V is a real vector space, OK? So I'm talking about a real inner product space. It's a mapping, and it has to have the following things, um, the inner product of um, say x plus y with z is equal to x comma z plus y comma z and um, likewise um, x with y plus z is equal to x comma y plus x comma z. Okay, so it's, and, and you can also pull scalars out of both, so it's basically, it's like a linear transformation in both slots. It's got that linear, linear, linearity of the slots. If I have a constant here, I can pull it out. I have a constant here. I can pull it out. So it's, it's, so, it's a so-called bilinear map, linear both slots. And what else makes the dot product a dot product? It's, you know, there's that. How about a dot b? It's equal to b dot a, right? So an inner product has to have that symmetry. And it also has to have that the inner product of x with itself is greater than or equal to 0. And um, since I'm separating it, the inner product of x with x is equal to zero if and only if what? x is equal to zero, okay. So these things, oh, and is there a triangle inequality? Hmm. I don't believe so. So this, these, these define what it means to have, if you have a v, a vector space over the reals paired with such a bilinear map, this makes V an inner product space. 
So you have these three competing notions of distance, inner product, norm, dist and metric space, right? They're related, but they're not the same, right? Can you see how to go from here to here, from this world to that world? Like, to go from here to here, it's easy. What I do is I define the norm of x equal to the square root of the inner product of x and x, right? That's like, that's the formula, like the length of a is a, the square root of a dot a, but done in the language of inner products. It turns out that you can sometimes reverse this arrow. It's actually possible to take a norm, take a norm and build an inner product. Sometimes you can do that, but not always. This, you need something called the parallelogram law. Okay, so I want to actually give you guys a homework problem where you can flesh that out a little bit. It shouldn't be hard, really. Mostly just algebra. Okay, so again, basically this arrow just goes that way, but definitely the reverse arrow can't happen. Now, there's a lot of things that you can, inner products are really important to geometry, especially in RN. Like, our inner product for RN is going to be the dot product. So, basically, that captures our notion of things being perpendicular. And so, one of the big stories in this course is going to be, you know, the study of tangent spaces and normal spaces. And so, that's all about the dot product. But, all right, I got that. Just uh, wanted to throw those terms out for you. Now, how would we how would we define um, if this is an open ball? What was it? If this is a ball, right? It, I, I would claim it's an open ball. What does it mean to have an open set? What's an open set look like? So I'm gonna um, let me erase everything here except for the norm spaces. We're gonna be focusing on norm spaces now. I just I wanted to give you that little spiel about the connection between. Uh, inner product spaces and uh, <clears throat> the metric notion of a metric space because I think it's important to have that big picture even if we're not studying metric spaces this semester so much. Okay. How do we find limit? I mean a more basic question though is what's an open set? So what I'm trying to now describe for you is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, there's a very, uh, I'm being very rude, I haven't given you any examples of norm spaces, <laughs> so we should do that, <laughs> duh. B1 is a norm space, right? We just, it's, it's just the usual thing, right? I'm referring to the D1 that I erased. So the norm of x is just the square root of x dot x, right? It's the square root of x1 squared plus x2 squared plus xn squared, right? So Rn is a norm linear space just with respect to the usual notion of length of a vector. V2. V2 was what? It was Rn by n? So what's, what do you think the norm of a matrix should be? Um, but I'm going to be very lazy. I, my, my suggestion to, uh, to you guys is what you can do is you can just say it's the length of the corresponding coordinate vector. So I would say that it's just the length of the beta of A. Where that was, this was, we just took A and we stringed out row 1, row 2, all the way out to row M. And here I'm referring again to this notion. Just usual, the usual Euclidean length. So basically, you just take the matrix, string it out as a big, big long m by n vector, and calculate the length of that in R M N. That, that's the that's the length of a matrix. Weird, right? What's the length? I think you see where this is going. What's the length of a complex vector? I think you know what I'm going to write here, right? 
it's just the length of the corresponding 2m, 2n dimensional real vector with, where you just string out the real and imaginary parts. What's the length of a, what's the length of a um, complex matrix? This is starting to get boring. Um, <laughs> right? It's just the length of the corresponding real coordinate vector. Now, I'm, I'm proposing that, that we can use those as our, our go-to definition. All right. Actually, this is by no means the only notion of length you can give to these sets. In fact, there's a lot of freedom. For a given finite dimensional vector space, there's actually infinitely many different choices of norm. They're far from being, the choice of norm is far from being unique. All right. You're like, well, you just said we're going to define limits in terms of the norm, right? That seems a little bit disconcerting. You told me there's infinitely many different notions of norm. Does that mean that the limit is going to be different if I use different norms? That would be annoying, right? Thankfully, no. The limit is actually insensitive to the choice of norm. Right? Because all the different norms you can look at actually generate what's called the same topology. What's a, what's a topology? Oh, now I'm digressing. But there's, this is kind of, this is not terribly, I mean, this is kind of like obvious. No, but something really magical happens for these examples in that there's another formula which is, which is slick for these. This is actually also called the, the Frobenius norm. So the, the Frobenius norm, if I put a square, it's easier. It's the trace of A transpose A. That's really, really awesome because I'm relating the proposed length or proposed geometry of matrices to this specific algebraic operation on matrix. That's very precious and awesome, this formula. That kind of thing, in an arbitrary vector space, you don't have some notion of multiplication, and you have no hope of such a formula. What's the formula for complex vector? There's also something there. You just take, basically, you take your vector, and there's different ways to write this, but here's one way I can write it. Um, I'm going to square it, just so I don't have square roots. I think if I take V and I multiply it, if I, well, I say V dagger times V. Now, V dagger is, what it is, is it is V1 conjugate, da, 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 V and conjugate. So basically, it's the conjugate transpose. This is also known as the Hermitian adjoint. It's an important operation in, in quantum mechanics. Okay. So this, but that basically just gives you the sum of the modulus, the modulus squared for the first component and the second component and the third component. It's like x1 squared plus x2 squared, x1 squared plus y1 squared plus x2 squared plus y2 squared plus da 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 plus xn squared plus yn squared, where we have those. It's just it is, it is just the sum of the squares of the real and imaginary components. It's just a slick formula for that. But that's a nice, big, complex formula. And so with this and this, down here, what you have, very similarly, the formula for the, the norm, you can just do the trace of z dagger. See? And that actually is a formula for the norm. So. If we could only work on the norm with these things, that would be kind of awful, right? Because once you use this coordinate map, you're pretty much throwing away everything you knew about the matrix as being a matrix. Because this coordinate map just lists things out, and you lose track of like what matrix multiplication. What does matrix multiplication look like at the level of coordinates? Something awful. So, okay. Getting back then to limit, how do we define a limit? I have until 1245, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. So there's two ways I can go at this point in the lecture. I could either tell you more about how we define limits, or I can show you more about different norms for a specific space. Um, I'm going to go ahead and define limit. All right? 
And then I'm going to go back and give you a little bit more um, why the choice of norm is not unique. No, it's, okay. it's 12.30, not 12.45. Oh, too late. But you guys already said 12.45, so. <laughs> 12.45 is in the next class. Minutes. Oh, well, there are other people who use this building, too, too that's true. <laughs> but you know math is the only subject that counts. <laughs> I'm in the math class at 12.45. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 so, um, what does it mean for a set to be open? Um, so, here's a picture of what is an open set. Basically, this is sort of a. So, this is U. What it means for U to be open um, in the metric sense, right? So, and when I say metric sense, I mean as judged by. This is a metric, right? So this is also known as the metric topology. The metric topology with respect to, I mean, so it, it's obviously with respect to a choice of form, to thinking of this as a vector space. But if you want, if this is too abstract for you, think about it being R2. What does it mean for a, you know, like a set in R2 to be open? It means that if you pick a point in there, like that, you can find a little open disk that is around that point P, and it's inside the set. That makes P what's called an interior point. So U is open, so let's say U subset of B is open if for each P in U there exists epsilon greater than zero such that the ball of radius epsilon centered at P is contained in U. That makes an interior point. If every point in the set is an interior point, it's an open set. Okay. Now, what does it mean for a set to be closed? It's a closed set. If it's complement, it's open. Right, that's our definition. definition. Um, I need, I need a, uh, I don't know, mass. S is closed if V minus S is open. And the, the V epsilon of P is just the, the abstract equivalent of like drawing a circle around P. Right. It's okay. it's it's a epsilon ball in the normal linear space. <laughs> oh yeah. Get nuts. Let's find a sphere of matrices. <coughs> you can do it. We have the necessary definition to be able to look for higher spheres of matrices. I mean, I'm not going to do it, but good. Um, there's your 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 imagination has all all kinds of things you can start thinking about here. But um, so that's open. That's closed. Um, other things we need from time to time, just while I'm on the topic. What's a boundary point? Point okay. where. Each open ball around the point has points in the interior and in the exterior. Yeah, right. If you if point if point is uh, the boundary, if when you look at that point and you take any open ball around that point, there's a thing. Every open ball around the boundary point contains points in and outside the set. Now the, the boundary point itself does not have to be in the set, right? So, but for every choice, for every radius, there's points inside and outside. That's a boundary point. Um, that's the topological boundary, anyway. And again, topology, don't be scared of it. It's just a word that means basically study of continuity and hand in hand the study of what's an open set. So, you know, I'm not, it's not a, maybe we'll have a course in topology here at some point, but uh, I'm not going to get into that. All right. So getting back to it, now um, what's, what's our definition of limit then? What, what do we mean by, if I say the limit, you know, suppose I've got a function from one normal linear space V to another one W, and um, I want to say that the limit as X approaches A of F of X is equal to, I don't know, B. What would that be? What would that, what should that mean? What should that notation 